So a quick review of the last module. In module two, we looked at the nature of revelation and of faith. Revelation essentially being God's manifestation of his very self. He communicates himself, not in mere authority, but in love. He reaches out to touch mankind and to real, reveal to us who he really is. He is father and he is creator and he is loving and merciful. In response to the revelation of God's self, we are invited to give our own self-gift to God, and that is the act of faith. What we will see in this module is a continuation of this conversation. Now we will look at the nature of faith and the nature of reason. With two major readings uh, that were assigned for this module, De Filius by Vatican I and Pope Benedict XVI's address at the University of Regensburg in 2006. Before we get to these documents, uh, we recall that we have read from Benedict already in module two with regard to his message on the 46th day of world communications. And he spoke on the notion of silence and the word. So reflecting on the nature of human communication, indeed we use words. Why so? It is because God himself communicates himself, his divine self to us through his word. Now that word can be found in inscribed in writing through the sacred scriptures, but also in flesh in the word incarnate. But effective communication, as Benedict draws out, is not simply about constant stream of consciousness and a flow of words, but rather, in order for words to take their depth of meaning, there must be periods of silence. And in the silence, the meaning of words, the meaning of what we communicate to each other, our ideas, and ultimately our very selves, take root. It is akin, as he brings out in his message, it is akin to the love of two persons who do not need many words to express their love, but to be present to each other, even in the silence. From there, we looked at the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation from Vatican II. This constitution is entitled Dei Verbum. And to give you a context for the teaching of Dei Verbum, I introduce to you Vatican II and its main progenitor, Pope St. John XXIII, the one who inaugurated the council. And this was in 1962, and the council ended in 1965. Now, it is John the 23rd's vision, that inspiration that he shares with us, when he says, throw open the windows of the church and let the fresh air of the spirit blow through. John the 23rd is inviting the church to engage the modern world, to raise the bastions, to let the spirit of God flow through and refresh the church and enliven the church for its ministry in sanctifying the world. The Vatican Council produced four major constitutions. Overall, it gave 16 documents at the end, but these are the four major pillars of the teaching of Vatican II. And of these, we looked at Dei Verbum on divine revelation. As you recall, Dei Verbum has six chapters, and you most likely read from Dei Verbum in your Intro to Scripture course. The latter four chapters directly deal with Scripture itself, Old Testament, New Testament, um, and Scripture in the Life of the Church. But it's the first two chapters which I chose to focus on, and here we come to the nature of revelation itself and the manner and means of its transmission through time. We answered these questions, the basics of what, why, how, when, and how long, and how do we respond to God's revelation. Ultimately, all of this culminated in the figure of Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of God's revelation, the sole mediator of our salvation. In response to God's great love revealed to us in the person of Christ who dies for our sins, we are invited to offer back to God in obedience of faith. And in Dei Verbum, paragraph 5, this is what we read. The obedience of faith is given to God who reveals, an obedience by which man commits his whole self freely to God. And then we get this definition of faith here. Offering the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals, and freely, freely assenting to the truth revealed by him. That's faith. So the obedience of faith is not an act out of coercion or submission, but it is a free submission in which one offers one's full self, one's full intellect and will given over to God. Why? Because God himself has given himself to us. And then lastly, we concluded the module by looking at Aquinas's Secunda Secunda, question seven, article one, in which Aquinas looks at the nature of faith itself. And he asks the question, is fear an effect of faith? What would you say, yay or nay? Indeed, the answer is yes. For Aquinas, faith does produce fear. 
Here we have the respondio in which he analyzes the nature of fear. When there is an apprehension of evil, fear is induced in us. It's a natural reaction to the evil. And when it comes to faith in God, that too can give rise to certain kinds of evils, such as the apprehension, he says here, of penal evils, the fear of penalty, fear of punishment, knowing and believing that God is a just judge, and he will not only reward, but also punish justly. Now that fear of punishment, oh, God knows I've broken his law and he will punish me, that gives rise to servile fear, called servile because it's the fear of the servant. On the other hand, there's also something called filial fear, the fear of the son or daughter out of reverence and love for the parent. Both of these are the effects of faith in God, but they differ greatly. Servile fear is what Aquinas will call uh, stems from a lifeless faith, a faith without life. Filial fear, in contrast, stems from a living faith. What makes faith a living faith? And he says at the end here, it is charity. It is love, love of the object to which we give our assent of faith that imbues that faith and makes it a filial faith so that we can relate to God as children of God, not as servants to a master. For this module, we come to the topic of faith and reason. And Pope St. John Paul II, in his encyclical, Fetus et Ratio, those are the Latin words for faith, fetus et, and ratio, reason, fetus et ratio, he speaks these words at the very opening of the encyclical, and I quote, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. Very beautifully spoken. He compares the relationship of faith and reason like the two wings of a bird. And it's with these two wings that a bird can take flight. So too, the human spirit can take flight to the heights of contemplation, to the heights of knowing and um, meditating and embracing and assimilating the truth. When we fly with the two wings of both faith and reason, one wing will not suffice. So to delve in this, into this material, before we get to Vatican I and Pope Benedict, I'd like to take a first survey of the notions of faith and reason. And we'll start first with reason. Here's a cartoon to start out. We have four cavemen, three of them are arduously at work pushing this boulder, and the fourth one stands behind, not contributing to the work, but rather he makes an observation and he says, but, but wait a minute, this is getting us nowhere. Ah, and the cartoon is entitled, The Dawn of Reason. Okay, when man begins to think and to contemplate and to analyze his circumstances and surroundings. But what is reason really? Reason is the highest and primary faculty of human beings. This is what makes human beings human, homo sapiens, wise, uh, intellectual creatures, rational creatures, because we have a rational soul. And this is what distinguishes us from irrational beings, other animals. Now, reason differs from sense knowledge, right? So if you sense something, if you've had lunch and you've savored the flavor of your lunch, that's a sense knowledge. But reason is something more. Okay? And it also differs from your feelings. Maybe you like um, the taste of your food or you like the people whose company you had while you, you were eating. These are our feelings. Reason differs from both sense knowledge and feeling from our experiences and it even differs from the will, the faculty by which we choose and we desire. Reason is something more. Now it differs from these things, but it's not necessarily opposed to them. Rather reason works within this matrix of our knowing through our senses, our experiential knowledge, and our desires of the will. Reason conceptualizes from those sense experiences and it directs what we choose in our will. So reason is this intellectual, cognitive, or knowing faculty that operates through concepts and reasons. So perhaps I like the, the taste of my delicious hot pizza and my will desires to eat more of it, but it's my reason who will direct my choice not to eat more than I should. So reason is that human faculty which examines, makes inferences, judges, and draws conclusions. In other words, it's discursive and analytical. It conceptualizes from experiences, and it can draw connections, it can analyze that experience, it can take it apart, put it back together again, it can reason from one point to another to a final conclusion. That's the work of reason. But when we speak of reason, we should also acknowledge that there is something that is legitimately a right reason, meaning Reason is a function, it's a power of our rational soul. And as a power and function, it can sometimes malfunction. It's not always correct. 
So if you've taken your quiz for module one, um, and maybe you, you did your studying and you were exercising your reason, drawing from your memory the correct answer, but to your surprise, you didn't have all the correct answers. Now, was it because you were not reasoning, you were not using your reason, and uh, preferring instead to fill what the right answer is? Probably not, or I hope not. Okay, so it's not about filling, it's about what is the, objectively the right answer. And you are employing your reason, but sometimes our reason fails us. Now, why does our reason err? From a the theological perspective, our reason is how we image God. Human beings are created in the image and likeness of God because they have a rational soul, because they have an intellect and a will, a mind by which to think and a will which is free and can freely choose. With the dawn of original sin, with the fall of humankind and sin entering into the human predicament, reason is clouded and the will is wounded such that now our will is still there, but we choose things that are actually bad for us. Or our reason is there, and we're trying to remember what the correct answer is, but our reason fails us. That is why sin is the cause of our dimmed reason. But nonetheless, the point here is that reason remains intact. It is at the essence of human nature. The third point I want to make here is that reason itself is not autonomous and uh, functioning apart from fundamental natural faith. Reason relies on faith. What do I mean by that? Now, if, if I ask you, which of you uh, were born outside of Houston? Maybe many of you. Maybe some of you were born in Dallas, maybe in Oklahoma City or elsewhere. Okay, with those who have their hands up, which of you were born outside of Texas or outside of the U.S. or outside of the North American continent? Now, if we chose one person, let's say someone says, I was born in, let's say, Vietnam. And we ask this person, how do you know you were born in Vietnam? Okay, give, use your reason and explain to me, how do you know you were born in Vietnam? And perhaps the person will say, well, it's obvious, I'm of Vietnamese descendancy. Well, are you sure? Well, just look at my parents, they might say. And my parents told me uh, they are Vietnamese and they, my mother gave birth to me in Vietnam. Is there ever a possibility that your parents might be mistaken? Are they ever mistaken? Yes. Could they be lying? It's possible, okay? So we can't rule out that possibility, it's possible. So you might say, well, I can prove it to you because I have a birth certificate. Well, is it possible to fake a birth certificate? That's possible too. This person will adamantly want to argue and maintain that yes, indeed, I know that I was born in Vietnam. How can you rationally make this argument? We want to do so. And when we do so, we do so relying on faith. You cannot verify every bit of truth that you know about yourself and about the world around you. Part of human living is to rely, is to trust, is to have faith in the world around us. We, we trust that our parents aren't lying to us. We trust that the world around us is real. We trust that um, the water you're drinking from your water bottle is actually water. Did you go verify it yourself? No, you didn't, but you, you, you take it upon trust. Maybe you'll, you'll leave this class and go to your next Zoom meeting, and let's say it's a history class, and you have an erudite history professor who gives you great knowledge in history. Did you verify these historical facts for yourself? No, you did not, and, and you don't, but, and, and yet you take copious notes very dutifully. Why do you do so? You do so relying, having faith in your professor that he's not lying to you, you are placing your faith in the university that they've hired someone uh, with credentials. You have faith in the world around you. No one has the time or energy to go verify every truth that we believe in because that would be too much. You wouldn't have time to actually live. So human life, human functioning, human reason relies in large part on faith. And of course, I am speaking here of a natural level, a natural faith a trusting in some authority beyond what you have verified for yourself. Now, if we do this on a very natural level, how much more so should we trust in God who is supernatural, God who is the creator of the universe? So that brings us to the topic of faith. So faith is this commitment of one, one's whole self to God in full submission of intellect and will. 
As we saw from David Berman, this is the proper response to a God who opens himself, who manifests and reveals his love for us. How should we respond? We should respond with an obedience of faith, a return, a reciprocal soft gift uh, to God. Now that soft gift, that trusting in God, in the same way that you trust your professor to be speaking the truth, or you trust your parents not to lie to you about where you were born, that trust is something like this picture you see down here. So if this little boy is standing up high and his father says, son, jump, I'll catch you. And the boy jumps. How does he know his father is not going to suddenly step aside so that he crashes onto the concrete and then the father will laugh at the son? The son does not even have the suspicion that the father might do that. Why not? Is he simply gullible and naive? Not necessarily, but rather he trusts his father. He might not jump if it were a stranger standing there saying, jump and I'll catch you, kid. But it's his father, and he trusts his father. So faith is this total self-gift to God that builds upon the fact that God is so trustworthy, so trustworthy that I can give him my full submission of intellect and will. Now, the letter to the Hebrews describes faith in these terms, and I quote, faith is the realization or substance of what is hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the realization of what we hope for. What we hope for has not yet come. And yet when we have faith, we make real, it's the process of becoming real, it's the realization of what we hope for. Or in some translations, realization is the translation of the word hypostasis, that's the Greek that is found in the Greek New Testament. Some translations have hypostasis translated as substance. And if you parse the word, you can see why you, we get this translation alternatively. So if we parse the word, we can split it right here in the middle, hypo being the prefix, stasis being the root. Stasis would be like a stance, hypo, what's the prefix hypo? So hyper would be like over, hyperactive would be overactive, hypo would be under, like hypothermic if your temperature is too low, you're hypothermic. Well, hypostasis, under, stasis, understands, understanding, meaning there's something of reason here. Or in this translation, it's the substance. If you give an argument that has substance, has power to it, it's compelling, um, then it, it gives understanding. So faith is that understanding, that realiza realization, that understanding that makes real the realities of what we hope for. So faith is not devoid of reason. It's, it's actually compelling reason at a higher level than just simply what is naturally known. And not only that, it is the elenstos, the evidence of things not seen. Clearly, this is looking here again at something pertaining to reason. It's the evidence that convinces our reason. So faith is real and faith is rational. It makes more sense. It makes real sense to believe in a God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church speaks of faith in this way, highlighting two aspects, and it is the nature of faith as supernatural and a gift, freely given from God, and as a human act. So, Catechism, paragraph 154. Believing is possible only by grace, free. Okay, so that's what a grace is. It's something freely and supernatural that's given by God, and possible through the interior helps of the Holy Spirit. So, this gift is given to us through the Holy Spirit. But it is no less true that believing is an authentically human act. So on the one hand, it's entirely supernatural. On the other hand, it is a real human act. What do we mean by human act? If you've taken your ethics course, then you know that human act is a philosophical term, and it is in contrast to the act of man. The act of man refers to the involuntary acts that we have. So for example, breathing is an involuntary act. You do not have to consciously direct your lungs to take in air and to exhale, you're not conscious of that. And yet it's part of your human activity. That is the act of man. In contrast, human acts are voluntary acts, acts that are willed, acts that involve both human freedom, free will, and human reason, understanding. When we act in such a way that we utilize our minds and our hearts, our reason and our will, then we are acting in the full capacity of being human. Now, we do this all the time. Every conscious and willful act is a human act. And very often, these are very important human acts. 
the perennial example is what happens when couples walk down the aisle and profess marital vows to each other until death do us part. Now, what's happening there? Someone is freely giving themselves over to another human being and vowing themselves for uh, an, an indefinite point in time because it's not until death that we shall ever part. And the Catechism describes this. So it says, even in human relations, it is not contrary to our dignity to believe what other persons tell us about themselves and their intentions, or to trust their promise. For example, when a man and a woman marry, to share a communion of life with one another. So when a couple professes marriage vows to each other, how do you know that the other person is actually going to keep their promise? How do you know that you're going to keep that promise? If you're 20 years old now, and maybe you're, the average lifespan is around 80, you have 60 years to go. How do you know you're, you're going to be faithful for those 60 years? How do you know you're even going to want to be with this person for the next 50 years? How do you know they want to be with you? And yet we, in good faith, make this self-gift. We vow ourselves in this way, trusting, trusting in the power of the love that you share, trusting um, in the love of the other for you and the love that you have for them. So that this love that you share can flourish and you build two lives, become one, and you live your life together. Now, if we can trust a human being to that extent, to the point of giving ourselves entirely in love and vulnerability to the other, how much more so does God deserve our trust? He who created us, brought us into being and sustains our life. Does he not deserve our trust, our faith? And the points that we're making here is that faith is the supernatural gift. It's given to us by God because he wants us to enter into his life, into his fellowship with him, as we saw in Dave Irvin. But at the same time as being supernatural, it's also fully, completely human. It does not negate the dimensions of humanity. Rather, real faith is when one is free and one freely chooses knowing what one chooses. So if you walk down the aisle and say, I do, only because your life is on the line, you're being forced or coerced uh, to say, I do, those marriage vows are not valid because you're not free. Now, if you are free, but you don't quite understand marriage as marriage, you thought you were getting into a, um, a temporary commitment, then even to profess the vows, the marriage would not be deemed as valid. So when we live out our faith, we must have an encounter with God. We must know God. We must come to have a relationship with him and freely choose to give our lives to him. Let's say in the past, maybe when you were a teenager, when you were 15, 18, um, living under your parents' house, and they said, you must go to church. So you were dragged to church, literally, basically. We could say that um, that was not a real human act. You were coerced. There was at least psychological pressure. Thus, your faith was rather limited or deficient. Faith requires a free ascent of the will, of the human heart. It's akin to that relationship of love. From here, let's look more carefully at the relationship of faith and reason according to Vatican I in a document entitled Dei Filius. So first, a little bit of background on Vatican I. The first Vatican Council is thus called because it's actually the first ecumenical council that took place at the Vatican. It started in 1869 and ended abruptly in 1870. And it was in that year in which the dogmatic constitution, Dei Filius, was promulgated. Now, constitutions or church documents are always entitled by the opening words of the original document in Latin. So Dei Filius, Dei is God, Filius is Son. So it starts out the Son of God. But the content um, or the English title gives you an idea of what the document is about. It is the dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith. So here at Vatican I, the Pope and bishops gathered in council are going to discuss the nature of the Catholic faith. Now the Pope who convened Vatican I was Pope Pius IX. He lived in a very difficult time in which the church was facing many new threats in the modern world. And so Pope Pius at this council wants to address these issues. And he will deal with the rising influence of rationalism, this excessive um, reliance on reason in contradiction to faith, or a liberalism, the throwing off of religion, 
or in materialism. Okay. All of this is happening around the time of the Industrial Revolution and political revolutions as well. So it was a difficult time. Pius IX calls his council and they convene and they issue two documents. The other one is Apostle Eternus, we'll read later in the semester. And this one we're reading here is on the Catholic faith, it's De Ephelius. De Ephelius has four chapters and each chapter has a very specific topic. Chapter one on God, two on revelation, three on faith itself, and four on the relationship of faith and reason together. And that's the chapter I asked you to read. Now what we'll find, unlike Dei Verbum in Vatican II, is all of the councils prior to Vatican II will end in what are called canons. And these are short, um, succinct, precise statements that summarize or that condemn certain positions, very clear condemnations. So we'll take a look at that as well. Here you have blessed Pope Pius IX, and he was one of the uh, longest reigning popes in uh, church history. He's also very well known for the syllabus of errors, living in a time of great challenges within the church and um, for the Catholic faith. So we will see this reflected in those canons of De Filius, this condemnation of many of the errors of the modern world. Now, the joke is uh, Pius IX was called um, Pio Nono, Pio, for the Italian for Pius. Non is the word for nine, but the play on that is no, no, as in tis, tis, no, no, because he was always shaking his finger, metaphorically, um, at all of the dangerous developments uh, in the modern world. Let's turn then to Dei Filius. <laughs> 